Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday space news update from me, and oh boy, it's been a crazy one. Massive Starship milestones have been passed, the crew for Artemis 2 was announced, SpaceX executed another flawless Falcon 9 launch, a successful return to flight for iSpace, and much, much more. Let's begin. The Starship orbital flight test has been at the forefront of our curiosity when watching Starship development ever since the SN15 made its historic launch, belly flop and landing almost two years ago. Can you believe how fast time flies? Well, I tell you what didn't fly anything at all from Starbase ever since. <laughs> SpaceX instead cracked on with Stage Zero and Super Heavy development, culminating to this very moment in time. Starship is now ready. And that's not like hyperbole, that's coming directly from SpaceX CEO and Chief Engineer Elon Musk himself. The only thing left now is a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration. When will that be? Well, the FAA did drop a clue on their air traffic control advisory, stating that a flight may be happening as early as the 10th of April, though this was later then updated to the 17th. Now, to be clear, this is just a general plan, it's not the license itself. In the background here, by the way, I've been playing some newly released footage of the Ship 24 and Booster 7 full stack. That's now primed and ready to go at the pad. But of course, a lot of things happened last week that led up to this moment, so let's take a quick recap of what happened. Beginning where we left off in last week's episode of Space This Week, Ship 24 was moved from the Rocket Garden to the launch site. However, stacking on Booster 7 didn't happen right away. Instead, we started seeing more cryoproofing tests of the massive first stage. Things began with the raising of the chopsticks, which then swung across and positioned into an almost lifting position. While in this position, we saw SpaceX perform some actuation tests of the booster's grid fins. It's easy to think of them as being really small when watching them like this, but this image here really shows the sheer scale of these things. The grid fins are some impressive bits of kit, and it's going to be great seeing them in action during during actual flights. Testing continued, with frost starting to form on the upper methane tank of Booster 7, and then on its lower liquid oxygen tank. They were filled at a fairly steady pace until the frosting covered the entire vehicle. Detanking then followed shortly after, and as the last bits of frost began to fade away, the arms were lifted away and lowered back down to the base of the tower. Then, it was Ship 24's turn to rise into the air. In the early hours of Wednesday, the chopsticks were hooked up to the rocket and began to lift it all the way to the top of the tower, but then, right as we were expecting to see it swing across over the booster, the ship was then lowered back down. From the looks of things, SpaceX workers noticed this bit of wire dangling below the rocket, which shouldn't be there. <laughs> After workers literally yanked the cable off, the ship was lifted once again, this time swinging over the booster and being lowered down. We saw quite a lot of drone inspection during the final alignment, completing what we hope will be the final ever stack of Ship 24 and Booster 7. The next time these things separate, it'll be at stage separation during the actual orbital flight test. Or during a rud. <laughs> Let's hope it's the former. Actually, saying that, one thing that still needs to happen is the arming of Ship 24's flight termination system, which we don't think can be armed while fully stacked. So if you see the ship come down briefly next week, then take that as a positive sign that the launch is imminent. Testing continued throughout the week. We saw the ship quick disconnect arm quickly disconnect connect and then reconnect, and scaffolding was removed from the launch mount. Don't really want that there when launch happens. NASA Spaceflight's livestream captured tracking dish testing as well. As for upcoming ships, Ship 28 appears to be fully welded together, here it is being lifted in the high bay. Over in Florida, our eye in the sky Greg Scott conducted another flyover at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Let's check it out. As you can see, the Star Factory building is now complete, and over here, the high base still hasn't started construction? Well, that's not entirely true anymore. It looks like things are finally set to start going vertical with this structure. Kind of. Some of the steel has been removed from the area, and some suspiciously similar looking steel has started arriving at Boca Chica. Meaning that it looks like perhaps this material is now going to form the new mega bay at Boca Chica rather than at Roberts Road. Greg also captured some photos and videos of the Blue Origin facilities. I don't really have any Blue Origin specific news this week, but one of their engine test stand cameras in Alabama captured this. 
That's an explosion. This happened on the 29th at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama during testing of the Centaur upper stage of the Vulcan rocket. Luckily, nobody was hurt, but it caused a lot of damage. United Launch Alliance, the company behind the Vulcan rocket, asked Blue Origin to secure the video for investigation, but there are still a lot of questions about the accident and how it will affect the schedule for the debut launch of the Vulcan rocket, which was supposed to be on the 4th of May. ULA is still investigating the accident and will fly when it is safe to do so. They have asked their primary customer to hold off on shipping the payload down to the launch site at Florida until they have more information about this anomaly. It's unclear how long the investigation will take and whether or not the rocket will be able to fly national security payloads for the Space Force in 2023 as originally planned, although it's worth noting that Tori Bruno was quick to say on Twitter that this incident was very unlikely to have implications for the Centaur upper stage that's currently in Florida for use on Vulcan's maiden flight. Ultimately, this is all a very hush-hush operation, so we will likely never know the true ins and outs of what exactly caused this explosion. SpaceX conducted just the one Falcon 9 mission last week. On the 7th of April, they successfully launched the Intelsat IS-40E satellite, which had NASA's Tempo instrument on board. The launch took place from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. With the Tempo instrument, which is a UV visible spectrometer, on board, the Intelsat IS-40E will be able to monitor pollution emissions in the troposphere, which is essential for protecting our environment. Following second stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage performed a boost back burn and then successfully landed on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas, which was stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. This wrapped up the fourth mission for this particular booster. Its previous missions were the CRS-26, one Web-16, and one Starlink mission. In Artemis news, the big story this week is that NASA announced the crew for the Artemis II mission, the brave astronauts who will orbit the moon. The crew consists of NASA astronauts Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, and Christina Koch, along with Canadian Space Agency astronaut Jeremy Hansen. During their 10-day mission, they will launch aboard the Space Launch System rocket and fly aboard the Orion spacecraft all the way out to orbit the moon. This mission, among its many other goals, will test the Orion spacecraft ahead of moon landing missions. The International Space Station also saw a Soyuz spacecraft relocation to a new docking port in preparation for upcoming traffic. The recent relocation of the Soyuz spacecraft freed up space for the arrival of the uncrewed Roscosmos Progress 84 cargo spacecraft scheduled to launch later this year. The crews on board the station carry out scientific investigations, research and experiments to understand the impact of long-duration space travel on the human body. This research is essential for ensuring the success and safety of a sustained human presence on the Moon and the journey to Mars through the Artemis program. Program. Two years ago, history was made as Ingenuity proved that flight on Mars was possible. Today, the team at NASA's Surface Robotics Lab is concentrating on what the next step should be. To this end, they are testing various prototypes for future Mars helicopters. Teddy Zanetes, an expert in the field, provided us with an update on Ingenuity, the helicopter that started it all. According to Teddy, Ingenuity is still operational after two years, having flown a total of 10 kilometers, or 6.2 miles, across the Martian surface. The helicopter's rotors, cell phone processor, and lithium-ion batteries are still functioning well, but the team is now paying close attention to the solar panel, which has started to accumulate dust over the years. However, they are still confident that Ingenuity can continue to operate effectively and continue to push the limits of what's possible on Mars. The lab's tests are part of the next Mars helicopter mission, which aims to create helicopters capable of not only carrying sample tubes, but also driving on the Martian surface. This technology will serve as a backup to the sample return lander, which will retrieve samples directly from the Perseverance rover and transport them back to Earth. Ingenuity is not only assisting with sample recovery, it is also influencing future Mars exploration. The team is exploring the Mars Science Helicopter concept, which features six rotors in a ring around a central structure. This technology could enable scientists to explore areas of Mars that were previously out of reach. Another area that the team is focused on right now is enhancing Ingenuity's current capabilities. They are working on increasing its speed and altitude and have added new flight software capabilities that allow it to detect landing sites while in the air. On the 7th of April, Beijing-based space company iSpace made their return to flight launch of their Hyperbola-1 rocket from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. Hyperbola-1 is a small, solid-fueled launch vehicle that has four stages, designed by iSpace to have a payload capacity of around 260 kilograms. The main goal of last week's mission, according to iSpace, was to check the measures implemented after the failed launch of the SQX-1Y4 mission and to confirm that everything with the rocket is now working correctly. 
Fortunately, the Hyperbola 1 was successful in this flight, entering its predetermined orbit without a hitch. Although there was no payload for this mission, this is great news for iSpace, as it shows that they have learned from their past mistakes and have been able to improve their rocket technology to ensure safe and successful launches. In sadder news now, Virgin Orbit has declared bankruptcy in the United States. It's not completely curtains though, as it's specifically filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which will allow it to continue doing business while restructuring its debts. Still, not great though. Virgin Investments, one of Virgin Orbit's sister companies, is giving them $31.6 million to keep the business going while they look for a new owner. Unfortunately, the company did have to lay off 85% of its workforce to save money. Virgin Orbit was set up in 2017 to operate the small rocket Launcher 1, which can get lightweight payloads into space fast and for cheap by launching them from the air under the wing of a specially modified Boeing 747. After four successful launches in California, in January, one of Virgin Orbit's rockets didn't make it to orbit because the engine overheated. This was their first attempt at launching a satellite from the UK, so it looks like the UK has now, for the second time, lost their ability to launch orbital rockets. Hopefully, the upcoming Saxaford Space Center carries a bit more longevity than Spaceport Cornwall. <laughs> Now on Aerospace had another busy week last week, I conducted an ambitious launch to the bottom of the mohole. I'm also at this very moment constructing something very special for Kerbal Space Program 1, as well as a mission to fly under all of the bridges at the Kerbal Space Center, which we did on livestream. You can check either of them out by clicking through to my channel, and hey, there's some names on screen! They're my patrons and channel members, and it's their generous support that allows me to continue making this content for you all. If you want to join their ranks, you can follow either of the links below, and be sure to check out either of the two videos on screen if they look interesting to you. But other than that, Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next one.